Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. Welcome into the newest edition of the Grittiest Take from Sports Fanatic News. I am Joe Borick, joined by Flyers Nitty Gritty, Yarif Wallock. How you doing today, Yarif? Joe, thanks for having me on, man. Happy to be back. Uh, excited to talk uh, Flyers hockey, you know, as excited as I can be. Yeah, and also check him out a couple days a week amidst his busy schedule of all the other great podcasts you do with the Getting Gritty with it and your new podcast as well. Um, so uh, obviously you have a very busy schedule, but check out his post-game lives. They're very awesome that are on the Flyers Nitty Gritty Thanks, YouTube page as well. And now before we get into anything else, um, to one of my favorite people since he's come over to the Flyers, uh, we have to wish a happy birthday to a special somebody, and that is happy birthday, Moose! Okay, now we can move on to everything else that we have to talk about in this podcast. Um, <laughs> so, after getting that out of the way, we can move on to other things. The first good piece of news is, um, after Morin got thrown out for something that Padro did later... Uh, he wouldn't. I think that was Pajo that hit my saying I'm into the boards, right? I think it was Pajo as well. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can't I'm pretty remember sure that was Pajo. Yeah, but he would have been we'll out there. On, we'll just blame it on Pajo. Um, but uh, for something he did later, Morin is not going to have a hearing, according to Sam Chichidi, uh, which is great to hear because that's one of those plays, um, from the ridding rule of what defines a major boarding where it's getting your head hit into the boards from behind. I guess from that, like, if you want to be the strictest of the strictest, like the dean of, like, the strictest school, then I can kind of, like, that, that I guess makes some sense, but nobody judges it like that. Like, you always see refs trying to use their judgment call based off of the size, where if a dude that's 6'7 taps somebody that's 5'9", just doing this is going to provide a lot more force than someone like me and you even checking that guy sometimes because we probably both suck at checking. So it's like it's it's one of those things I think you have to take into account the size where it needs to be graded equally and you can't kind of give somebody the treatment, bad treatment just because of their size where you see this in hockey and you see this in basketball when it comes to really large human beings via fouls in basketball and then penalties in hockey. I just think he's going to get that early in his career until he gets a good reputation bill just due to his size. We see people tweeting now, Chara would never get called for that. No, he wouldn't now. But when he first came in the league, would he have potentially got called for that? Probably. Because it was kind of the same thing. When he first came into the league, Nobody knew who the hell he was. He was just this big dude that was running around like a wild man with no chicken with no head destroying people. So it was kind of the same thing, and now he's a Hall of Famer, so he's never going to get called for that. So if Morin's not going to become Char, don't get me wrong, that's a, that's a big ask. But if you could become a reputable defenseman, don't you think that would eventually do away with those kind of calls that you get as a rookie sometimes that are just not the way it should be, but it is unfortunately the way it is? Well, I'll, I'll say this about the the morning. The first thing I'll say is they'll think twice about coming into our zone. So regardless of the penalty, um, I would much prefer that the team continue to play that way. Um, it's There's unfortunate. A- yeah, I think the, the call really came from the reaction of potential injury. And I think it was worth maybe a two-minute call just because I don't— I think it was necessarily a reckless hit. I do agree with you. But I do think Morin has some responsibility to know, hey, you're going to potentially kill this guy uh, and not probably set him up to die. So I, I will say that. And do I agree that the penalty should have been called in overtime? I mean, obviously. I mean, both of them should have been a two-minute call. That That's how I see it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the issue is that one was such a severe call. And the game misconduct, I think, comes like as a default to a five minute major if there's like a potential injury. So I think at that point they have to throw him out. So it is unfortunate because of his reputation now and his size. And I do agree. I think over time uh, it'll work its way through. But I personally, the fact that the Flyers killed it, use it as momentum builder. It yes, but it I it bothered me, but it wasn't the reason we lost the game. So the way I kind of look at it, at it and maybe in the long game is you know, Sam Warren punched somebody in the face and it feels like the attitude of this team kind of changed. And I'm not like kidding. Like, I'm not kidding. Like he punched Lemieux in the face. He got a fine. And all of a sudden things change. And 
this is a team that was getting bullied mentally. So I think there's some positives to it. Having said that, uh, I think it was an excessive call. And I do think over time, yeah, you do gain that respect. And I agree with what you said about Chara. Also, probably Chara more likely to make the mistake of pushing the guy into the boards rather than later, you know, probably maybe wrapping him up. But I, I agree that comes with experience and building a reputation with the, the refs. Yeah, no, that's kind of how I see it too. Because also that call on, uh, I believe it was Tuesday's game against the Bees in center ice was not a roughing. Uh, by yeah. any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. So I think that's another thing where that was just size hitting a guy where the ref saw it differently just due to the size level. It's like um, if you're hitting Danny Briere and you're Samuel Morin, you're probably going to destroy him and make it look a lot worse than it is just due to the size differential. So, Or you're going to accidentally well, think- hit him up high like he did there where he didn't really hit him up high. He just hit him and it in- looked like it because of the well, size in- difference. In that case, was it Mayfield that he hit that he got the roughing call on? It was a Scott Mayfield, the guy he had a fight I with. I thought that was in the Bru. I thought that was in the Bruins. Oh, game. it was in the Bruins it's game. The, I'm sorry. It the, was somebody who yeah. maybe it was either Miller. It was somebody who or Frederick maybe somebody who was rough. Might have been Trent Frederick. Yeah. Yeah. So it was somebody that he was definitely having a bout with in that game, and I think it was a response to Moran's energy. I don't think it was a penalty. I don't think it was a penalty. No. But I, I do think they're looking for it because I think Morin, and this is what I love about Morin, this is where the Pronger comparison is real. It's not that he is the same defenseman as Pronger. He has some of the same capabilities, right, being a six, seven, almost six, eight defenseman. But really what it is is that he is mean. He, he's incredibly nice as a person, but on the ice he's very mean. So I think the refs probably see that to some degree and maybe are being a little touchy with him. Maybe they don't know him that well. Um, I do think the calls have been, you know, unfair. A little uh, soft. But, yeah. but I can see why they're hard on him because if you look at more, like, he's very loud. He's very big. He's very strong. We saw even Mayfield, who's a big, strong guy. I mean, he drug that guy across the ice, right? He's going to do that. This is why we want to hold on to more, and hopefully he doesn't get taken in expansion. I was thinking about that. It would suck. Yeah, he's a guy that could come up um... – in the expansion draft, that's a good point. I wasn't necessarily thinking of that. That would be another Wolf Fletcher trade uh, and potentially make a mistake like nah. he did in Minnesota to I, keep I think, a defenseman. <laughs> I think, honestly, oh. I, th- I think the way Fletcher's behaving right now is very much I learned from my past. I didn't trade Ghost. I didn't panic at first. Um, he traded Brent Burns, right, pretty early in his GM. And then he had the expansion where he moved a bunch of assets. This is why I don't expect the Flyers really to do anything. And I think there is a degree where Fletcher knew that maybe they weren't going to take a step back, but they weren't going to take a step forward because he didn't add anybody to achieve that. You know? Oh, I'm just saying, like, will he trade them ghost with something you wouldn't expect him to give Seattle? So I with think, how he's seeing no, 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 him, no. I think what he's going to do is learning. Well, sorry to cut you off, but from, I apologize. But what I was trying to get out is um, this second time around, right? He did that. He made that mistake. He got him fired. Last time he did that, he he protected Vatnin, who ended up getting traded like four times so far. It's like, I think he's just going to go, whatever you get is whatever you get. You want Ghost, you want JVR, whatever. I'll I'll react to it. If I lose 7 million because you take JVR, I got 7 million cap space. Right, it's like everything's. Yeah, it's also you're probably going to end up leaving one of them because if you look at their, they don't have the clauses where you automatically have to protect them. The Flyers are likely to potentially leave one of either JVR or Voracek exposed. Um, I think and JVR for sure. I don't think Voracek will. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot. You have to protect Hayes and Giroux, so that doesn't give you an option there. And then you're going to protect Couturier, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, the other, I would say, Jakey, and then what is it, four, four, and then three? No, no, it's seven. It's seven, three, and one. There's two different options. You can do four and four. I think you can do four, four, and one. Yeah. yeah, you could do four, four, one. The Flyers so won't opt op- for that. So the Flyers would have Fairby still exempt, I think. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty so sure Patrick Oscar. is too. Yeah, Fairby, and then well, Patrick's an RFA, so I think that's why 
if they take him as an RFA, they would have to sign him. So it becomes kind of their decision. Sure. I think at that point. Yeah. But if you, you would protect obviously Limblum. So there's one Couturier. Okay. Can be, you have to connect. Yeah. Protect uh, Hayes and G. So there's five. Voracek would be six. Um, and then, and then you would Patrick. kind of tap. Have a if, decision. Yeah, you if, can protect Patrick as an order. I don't. Yeah, I feel like Patrick might be exempt. I don't know if that's. I honestly, the rules have been so weird, Joe. That like every time I say something, somebody finds something else. Like, oh, it's not that. So I don't. I, I think we should wait and see on the rules. But let's just admit, see if they have to put Jake out there, right? Uh, or that they, they, they'll either have. To I also do- don't know if Jake will get taken by a new new franchise because yes, he's a good player to build around, but he's also a guy that's coming in at over eight million. So you gonna want to commit to that as your first big contract? That's more uh, honestly. Like Vegas here's... did it, but will Seattle kind of do the same thing? Well, will they get some of the guys with the bigger salaries? I mean, the reality is, if, if he's exposed, he's probably the best right winger that they have available. That, regardless of what our fan base thinks, I mean, Jake Voracek's production. Yeah, I mean, he's leading. Yeah, he's leading. I mean, I he's leading our team in points right now. Two of the guys we're talking about are it. Even JVR is very consistent in what he does. He's actually having his best season. He had a down year last year. It's just th- this year, and to your point, Joe, this year I think what it is is that so many teams lost money financially, right? Like I was saying the other day, that it's not even just like, is this guy worth cap money? It's like, yeah, we'll give him $8 million cap. But it's like we lost $20 million this year in revenue. Like we don't have money. So are we going to bring in? And, and the risk, right, Vegas came in and just rolled in and just started making cash. Is that going to happen to Seattle this time? Maybe they don't want the eight million. Maybe they want a bunch of four million dollar contracts. Because they're not sure how their team's going to be profitability. That's the other point. thing of it. Where I think when you look at other sports, if you look, the only team that you might argue, and I would still say they're not necessarily one of the bigger markets in their sport, is the Hawks. And I would still say the Seahawks are teetering middle, like high middle market NFL right. team. And then the Mariners are sure as hell ain't a big market. Uh, Baseball team, where I feel like in Vegas, that's more of a city. You got the pizzazz, you got the whole show that they put on, which is honestly great before the games and all that stuff. Um, you don't have that same effect in Seattle, so you got to have some other draw. You have to find something, and it's not the biggest, not as big of a market as Vegas, in my own opinion. So it's going to be interesting to see how they manage it. I feel like if they were somewhere more equivalent to Vegas, I could see them bringing in as big of a contract, but. I'm with you, too, from the forefront. I feel like the Flyers would be dumber to expose Jake, even with how good JVR is doing, just from the whole he's been here for so long, knows the locker room thing. Vor- or yeah. Excuse me, JVR was here, gone, and then back. I think they so I feel them. like they would probably leave JVR open or move him, yeah, if they could move him or leave him as the guy that is exposed in the uh, – expansion draft is yeah. a potential and then ghost is just automatically going to be exposed because of the defenseman you're yeah. going to protect otherwise yeah no and i agree and in jake's case i think like if in jake's case like yeah i it's not saying it'd be impossible for him to be exposed and like you're saying all good reasons because it'd be tough to take on especially in this climate but you look at jake he's a locker room presence as well he's been a star player for how many years there's a team out there he's a big name there's a team out there that could be like, hey, we have a big name veteran guy. We need a right wing to help run our power play and stuff. We have a big tough center, or whatever, that makes seven and a half million, eight million a year. Well, let's swap. Or Duchesne, and maybe that's not a great example, but Duchesne for Vore Checker. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying we want to do that. I'm just saying that that could be the way I see Jake really moved, where JVR is a guy that was overpaid from the day he signed that contract. In my opinion, he he came in here overpaid. Like he was never a seven million dollar player, even in his peak, right? And I think that's the problem with JVR, and that's why it's so easy to expose him because, like, even if he hits 50, 60 points, it's still not the type of player that's worth seven million. Where Vorchek is a play yeah. driver, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, that makes sense uh, to me. But uh, that's uh, I think we went over a good bit of what could happen in a uh, expansion and talking yeah. about the guys Sorry. there after giving a. Uh, more in shout out and then the moose uh, birthday shout out um other news we have today is um forward tanner lazinski um from the taxi squad to the phantoms and then Derek pouillot has been recalled to the taxi squad from those said phantoms 
Uh, so Luzinski um, will get um, more time to play for the Phantoms after playing what I thought were two pretty good games to start in the NHL. And I feel like that might be short-lived uh, as we we'll get to um, Lance's uh, article um, he's had later with some young guys potentially uh, playing in the lineup sooner rather than later if we move some people. But Lazinski got sent back now. For now, Pouillot on the taxi squad. Um, this is just kind of a lead into the trade deadline is coming up on Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. At this point, where do you want the Flyers to be? Do you want them to be buyers? Do you want them to be sellers? Or do you want them to be in the middle so they're doing stuff for kind of this year, but also with the future in mind would be what I would kind of characterize the middle as, and then my next question will be after this, what do you think they're actually going to do compared to what you want them to it's, do? That's funny. I was going to say, well, I, I was going to say I have two answers because I have what I want to happen. And then I have what I think probably is most likely, which I don't think is too far from what I want to happen because I'm pretty conservative, but I, what I would ideally like, and I don't want to see Scott Lawton trade. I don't want to see really any roster player traded, but after kind of what's happened, I'm open to it. But I would like to see a piece come in here, ideally, that could move forward with the squad. Having said that, I recognize the situation with Phil Myers and all these protection things. So I don't even know if I want us to go for a defenseman unless we're going all out. Like, I would be intrigued if the Flyers packaged Lawton Myers and went out and got a superstar. That would intrigue me. I'm not saying I want to see that, but that would be really interesting. The, what I would want to see is kind of the reality as well, which I think is the reality. And this is what I expect from Chuck Fletcher, which is why I want to see it, because it's an understanding of kind of where we are and probably what we need to do to become the team that we th think we are, if that makes sense. And I think it really requires an offseason. And it doesn't really matter if we trade Lawton now. Like, it, that can help all this stuff. But in the grand scheme of things, we have the assets to get everything done we really need to do. It's really about what's the temperature of the league, what are the prices of players, are people able to take on money? So it's, I don't want any panic moves. Like we were talking before this, I saw like Nolan Patrick being, you know, pushed hard. Like I don't want to see anything like that. None of that stuff sounds real to me, and I don't want to see anything like that. I don't want to see any reaction to a bubble insane season. If it happens again next year, then fine. Now you can start moving Patrick and panicking. But the reality is, is that I don't want to see that. So what I want to see is, him clearing up what he can, if you really think you're not a playoff team, which I don't expect them to do, um, then yeah, move Raffle, move Lawton for assets. Keep, keep it simple. But realistically, I think the Flyers will hold on to everything, bring in one player at a cheap cost, and roll with it, go into the offseason, start over. Another guy I wouldn't be surprised, I know Jamie tweeted about it at the end note of a tweet about how he looked in his first game back, is Hag's going to be an odd man out eventually. When it, especially with more in now in the defensive, um, in the defensive uh, tilt. Instead of yeah, instead of just losing him in expansion, Could. he's a guy that with next year on his contract, it will be interesting to see if Fletcher tries to get no matter what round pick it is or what random level prospect it is, just something for him to just kind of go with that mentality. Let's get something rather than absolutely zilch uh, for somebody but can where I, can I, you can, can I have to Yacht or someone come in Sorry. if we're going with the mindset of like, we think this team's kind of not, you can try to push it, but we don't think you're going to get there. Plus new vibe and a new guy in the room might not be the worst thing either. Cause we've seen it work already when Morin stepped in to have more new voices in there where to kind of get the mojo going, especially with the energy that these guys seem to have when they come up from the Phantoms, like Tanner brought in for sure. two games, Warren's brought in since now. So I wouldn't be opposed. I've always liked the idea of Hag. I was a great big body guy that can block shots and everything. But normally nowadays you don't see two of those guys in the same lineups anymore around the league, where if you keep Warren and Hag in, you would be probably one of the only small on one hand at most of teams that have two just big body, same guys in that's more of the old mantra. So, so I feel like having one of those guys in like Washington does with Chara, that's how most teams do it. Most guys wouldn't have Chara and Robert Hag in their yeah, life. I, I think 
Char is a little bit of exception because he's a legend, but I do agree with you. You typically have like one defensive defenseman guy. You could even argue we already have Braun. So we or don't need one either. like bruiser guy that because like those guys are both yeah. guys that'll check and block shots. Like yes. normally nowadays you don't see two like you don't see two Scott Mayfields in New York's line. Right. Right. Like, yeah, no, 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 you're right. You're right. You're right. I I I think it's um I think there's the other way. Like, I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, right? There's an opportunity to get something for Hag. He has value. Here's the other thing. Like, think about what we're talking about, too, though, right? Think about the amount of players we just named that potentially could be exposed. And let's not, let's avoid uh, Voracek and JVR, right? Ghost, NAK, Haig, let's say Morin. Do you see how, like, that's actually kind of tempting. So maybe, just maybe, Fletcher, Fletcher, Chuck Fletcher goes, well, I'm just going to keep all of them. Whoever, maybe Lawton as well. Goes, whoever, goes, yeah. whoever goes, goes, right? Like, yes, I do lose out, but I leave a decision for the team that they have a large variety of guys, so they feel like they lose no matter what, and they don't feel like they can if get they me. want, If their idea to get somebody at our point of picking from our team is a defensive, just bruiser defenseman, it would be interesting who they pick just from the, the fact of, we all have confidence in Moran moving forward and his health and everything. But, but the, the big thing is, do they? Do they right. have confidence in that moving forward where Hag is actually, other than now for the last right. three weeks, has been healthy um, until he we came back Moore. for the last three weeks, more in his career. So right. I wouldn't be shocked if just from that premise, they decided right. to lean towards Hag, who already also has a contract. So you also don't have to worry about that side of the equation either. Right. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if they do uh, lean like, towards that. But one guy, one guy. Like oh, let the, no, I was just going to say, it's like let the chips fall as they may, where he didn't do that before. Last time he's like, no, let me trade this to keep this guy. And he's like, you know he what? Over, which we did, he's not in Fletcher's defense. Um, I didn't really care when he did this because he was with Minnesota. Right, right, right. Obviously. But in his defense, he's not the only guy that did that. Other exactly. teams we jerk reacted. We saw even right. Kakalainen in uh, Columbus because I'm Florida. pretty sure he was their GM when they made those moves. Yeah. Uh, they got rid of Carlson. It was in Columbus. If I'm not. so, um, like there's different guys that are even some of the hurt. best in the game that, that could happen. To think us. are going to be a hundred percent Hall of Famers when their career's over because Kakalainen pulls guys out of the sixth round overseas. You're like, where the hell did this dude come I mean, from? I mean, um, that could happen to us with Ghost. Like if Ghost is taken. Right. Or even Haig. Like what happens if Haig gets taken? All of a sudden Haig is like playing like a like a legit top four guy. And we're like, well, he was a late or early second round pick. He was, you know, could happen on a better team. Playing and those guys are usually when you pick guys in those type rounds, you don't typically see those guys come up at 23 through 24 and own it. They're normally the later developing guys anywho so yeah i wouldn't be surprised but i think if they take hag as much as i've always liked them it wouldn't be too hard to swallow because if Morin could stay healthy and keep doing his thing you kind of have the guy you th- if you wake both of those guys potentials Morin's would be above hag if they could hit their peak so, sure yeah no nah, yeah. i would agree and and the reality is is that a guy like hag you can go out and get a veteran like nate not nate prosser but maybe somebody a little bit better than prosser that can play that role for a year for you too. They're not hard to find, but a young guy to develop Joel is Anderson hard to find. Is pretty much a veteran version of Robert Hay, and he his value is pretty high. <laughs> if you think about it, I mean, he had a pretty high value, and I think he got what three and a half million a year or something this off season. Yeah, which he's also a guy that kind of kept ascending as he better with age. Right. So Hay could end up fitting into that Swedish category. defenseman. Man gets better with age. Um, yeah. But I thought a guy, when it comes to the deadline for me, just because he kind of fits into Philly for me, where he'll kind of kick anyone's ass if he feels like it, um, and he'll also score whenever he feels like it with the right lineup, was uh, Anaheim's been terrible recently. So when it comes to, we don't need forward depth, but could we use a guy that, other than McDavid averages the best 5.5 shots because we're not the best 5-on-5 team, and that's Ricard Raquel? Yeah, I think that I was going to bring him up. Be, that's yeah, so I think that I might him. actually be a pretty good pickup because he plays with a tenacious um, side to him. Love him. Gets score, shoots a lot, and also isn't afraid to block shots. And if needed, we don't necessarily need him for the PK. But if needed, you could use him for the PK um, here as well, like the Ducks have in times in the past. But you have the Lawdens of the world 
and when the Zinsky's up raffles of the world and the max, so you might not need him for that, but you could use him for that. But I think he's always been underrated. He's in a Ducks lineup that don't have people to set him up right now. So obviously right. his numbers are not going to look too sexy. If you bring him here and you have Jake to pass from, like you said, as a play creator, you have G who's doing it all this year. You have Cooch or TK, um, even Farabee, who's a great passer at such a young age to pass to him. You're going to see his numbers go up, and he's a guy, also a UFA. You don't have to worry about him screwing yeah. you for expansion. You can re-sign him and have him be what you were saying earlier and what I completely agree with is a now guy to help the culture of the team when he comes in now and use this half year for him to learn the culture and then work on re-signing him um, after the season, obviously, so you get around that expansion draft loophole and kind of have a handshake thing, and then as soon as you get around that, you uh, re-sign him in the offseason. I think that could be a good move, being the big key with him is he's only 27. So you still have a good amount of his prime years left. Here, that, so I actually love him. It's funny. And I – so my only issue with that is, is do we actually have that role open for him on this team? Again, that assumes that Nolan Patrick wouldn't be taking it. it. Assumes that Morgan Frost isn't going to be part of this top six. And it's like if we bring him in here, which again I do think it's somewhat possible. And I again I really well, if like JBR him. JBR goes. It also you have that's to. What I'm that's what Somebody's got to move. Thing, yeah. Someone has to move in that top nine. That's my whole point. And realistically, if you're moving a guy like Raquel, you probably want him here for the long haul. You're giving him a six year deal, right? He's a good player. He's 27 years old. You have you want to have him until he's 20, 32, 30, 33. Um, I really like him. I, but I would say if we're bringing him in, it's because we've made a big move and we're adjusting some. You know what I mean? We're making a large adjustment, which is possible depending on what we do with the D. Yeah, yeah. I think it would have to be a different move, obviously. You would have to either bring him in now because you have the space and then – think of later what the hell you're doing with JVR or others or wait to just sign him uh, in the off season. It would be one of those. Cause if you bring him in now, you're playing him, you're fine somewhere yes. to play him. It's just, he won't be in the top six would, um, all the time. I would love so. to steal their defenseman, to be honest with you. I don't know if that's possible. But what's the name? Um, Lindholm, Hampus Lindholm. That's the type of guy we need. Yeah. That's There's also, not um, if you want to get a defensive defenseman, why am I blanking on his name right now? Because we haven't had a... Uh, Manson? Manson. Yeah, Josh yeah. Manson. Because he's, Is he a UFA? He's basically... He's basic, I think he might even be might a be. UFA after he this year. Me, I'm going to pull it up on cap. He might be a right UFA now. and he might be right-handed. Yeah. As we, he is right-handed. I know that for a fact. But yeah. Manson's a defense, a more of a guy that if you want him to, he can pass it, but a good defensive anchor. He's kind of like... If you turn back Justin Braun to five years ago in his career, um, what does that tell you? Where now he's still doing good, but can't move as quickly. Right. That's where Manson's at when healthy. He's one of the better graded defensive defensemen. Um, I feel like he's a pretty good guy to have on your squad and is also one of those guys that falls into that Brett Pesce defensive defenseman category of nobody ever talks about him as much as they should probably talk about him. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's the thing. He actually does have next year with a modified no trade. So he would have to uh, agree. Would be screwed. No, we can't um, get... you would have to, yeah, can't you would have it. to see when it comes to expansion. But for him, I remember when I talked to it with Steele when it came to that. If you get Josh Manson, I think that's you openly admitting you're moving on from one of the other guys My that guys. have next. Which is either, yeah, you're moving on from maybe him as a youngster or you're definitely moving on from probably a ghost. So that would give you more prone to say. Yeah, but you can't you can't protect them. You can't protect. Because no, if you, you have can't. A gnome, so would, but if you bring you, in Manson, taking I think it right? gives you leeway to reach out to Ron Francis and say, we have a veteran. What would it take to give you that might not screw do, you because you brought him in see, to the league? Do you see what I'm saying? Like that that's how I know that none of that stuff is gonna happen. Because as soon as you put yourself and again, I'm not knocking you, as soon as you put yourself in a position where somebody has leverage over you, we're screwed. Right. So we have to avoid that at all. Our leverage this year is that we have money and we have cap space right now. So if a team is desperate for money, can we st can we give them almost nothing for a player that's clearly worth more? You're like, and again, I'm not using rope, but is this a year where you can steal 
OEL from Arizona because they're broke and be like, I'll give you Scott Lawton yeah, well, and Robert Haig. You know, I'm just joking around. But yeah. you know, if you get him, it's also going to be um, you still have to find screwed. to fit him into your protection process. You'd have to do. And that's my point is you'd have to do everything after expansion. And that's why I think we stink this year to some degree. Yeah, I think it could be for planning ahead. That made some sense. You were talking about that in your um, video last night. But I also think there's a lot of impending UFAs. Uh, I forgot, honestly, Manson had next year still. But you got Demirs, who is a little bit older, a couple years younger than Braun, um, though, still. Um, is a, a guy you bring in. Uh, you have um, – who else is on that Arizona team? Everybody in Arizona might get traded. Oh, uh, you have Alex Goligoski. Um, as a veteran defenseman that won a cup, I want to say in 2009 yeah. with the Penguins. Um, if I remember that correctly, I think 09 yeah. is one of the years that dreaded Penguins team won. Um, yeah. And then you have uh, Nicholas Jomerson, who also has an expiring contract. So again, Arizona. He's the best. He would be our best option, like you're saying. I mean, he's the most tenable for us, or what we actually want. I would agree with you as far as like a defensive defenseman from that team. Yeah, and then you also could, if you want to bring in a guy that has a bigger cap hit for this year, you could bring in that you're talking about. I know you talked about kind of changing the culture in some of your videos and stuff of that nature. Yeah. One guy that would do that, that can play center and or wing, I'm assuming we wouldn't be on his 10-team no trade list, uh, would be Nick Felino. If you want to kind of bring in that good culture. I was thinking, yeah. The guy. In the locker room, he has this year still at five five. But then after this year, you're paying him whatever the hell you negotiate, which is not going to be five and a half no. million. So uh, you're bringing him in just for that. You also could probably get Kakalina to eat some of this year. So you have that, and then he might be a half decent guy um, to bring in when it comes to that. That's just something I thought of. If you want to go with a great shooter to the same degree of Raquel, just not as chirpy of a player, but mm -hmm. isn't as non chirpy as you would think he would be for his size sure another high leverage shooter is two years younger connor garland that for some reason i don't think should be traded even if they don't think they're going to be good for three years because he's only 20 freaking five but for some reason is in trade rumors and if they want to trade him you might as well ask what the hell they want he's probably but not get, available but yeah you know what i mean like to your point you're probably right go ahead yeah, it's one of those guys that doesn't make sense, but it's Arizona, and Arizona never makes any damn sense except for Rick Tockett. So if your name's not Rick Tockett, nobody makes sense in Arizona. So that's the other side of that equation also. Um, and then Kyle Palmieri, a guy I always liked, already got moved, yeah. unfortunately. I think the big other guy we could look to since we need more righty defensemen, which is kind of blatantly obvious, then we need left-handed defensemen for our team. If you just look at our team and watch five games, you can probably realize that pretty quickly. Um, David Savard, even though his numbers aren't as sexy this year, might be someone the Flyers look at and go, well, Columbus just isn't playing as good this year as a unison for whatever reason. Um, who cares what that reason is? But that could be a big reason why Savard's numbers – don't look as good if we bring him into here and get him to kind of help our young defensemen like ergo philly myers as another as a fellow right-hander that could be helpful and he's one of those guys that kind of isn't bad as a big right-handed guy to get the first pass up he's just not going to do anything savvy in the offensive zone but he's not like the one thing um we see braun get trapped with sometimes is getting the pass out of the zone his numbers have been good overall this year. I th I've liked what I've seen from Braun, but that's the one thing I think Savard kind of does better just because he still has what Braun had a couple years ago where you're starting to see in some capacities the age effects of Justin Braun, where I think with passing it out of the zone and getting trapped, he can't move like he used to. It's easier to get trapped when he can't move like he used to. Yeah. There's nothing against that player. It's just you're 34 going on 35 instead of being 27 anymore. So well, that's he's a good my... guy to still have, but it was your point on the video. Braun should be your third line guy. Right. If Braun slides down to your third line guy, Savard probably still could play with Proby. He probably, again, no, shouldn't necessarily always be on your first line, but is more inclined to hold 22 with plus minutes than a Braun at this point of his career. So yeah. that could help but, you. But, that. but here, yeah. here's my problem with that. And I, I don't disagree with anything you said. 
But here's my problem with that. And the more I think about Savard, it's like, but what kind of upgrade really is that? Like, what are we really talking about? Are we, are we just making a trade to make AV happy? Because at a certain point, like, I'm actually kind of getting annoyed. Because it's like every player that we're talking, like, oh, I don't want Friedman. Oh, Carter Hart's not that good. Yeah, okay. Whatever you say, AV. You know, like, and again, I really like AV. I respect him, and I don't know exactly what's going on. But at a certain point, I'm like, you're not going to pull the rug under me and tell me that David Savard is going to come in here and solve my problems. I don't think that's going to happen. And that's no, why I'm like, no, no, not you. I just could be a nice veteran. No, just let me let me get this out. No, I agree. It's a, it's a nice addition, but it's not. These aren't the moves that are going to fix the problems that we're dealing with. And I think that is essentially what I'm kind of talking about is like, I don't want to see how the season finishes out. This is my point, okay? If I consistently see that AV continues to make excuses about what he doesn't have, I would rather just remove the coach immediately and get more out of the players I can get because at that point, he's the problem. I've seen some hints of that so far. I don't know if that's the case. But again, the pattern is usually pretty consistent. You will see that person point fingers at everybody else but themselves until eventually there's nobody else to point at, and then you're the one who gets removed. I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but I'm like, and again, I, I only say this because like I'm listening to what you're saying, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. You know, like I want David Savard too, but I'm like, what? That's for this year. Like next year, Phil Meyer is going to be better than David Savard. And then what? What do we do? What do we trade to get? Oh yeah, do you well, see what I'm saying? I think it's also if you get David Savard, I think Braun at this point of his career, like the points you made is more of a six. And then at that point could be your six, seven, if he works up and everybody, cause you're only, you're paying him like a six slash right. guy that comes in and out. Yeah, of yeah. Where Savard is still a tier, a notch tier above that. You might play him as the guy that stays in like, that's like two, whatever For as sure. his cap or three as his highest. And then he'll be the guy in the lineup. Braun will be your nice depth. And it will kind of, set okay. your defensive depth better. So I think um that could be something as a veteran okay. he's a good voice to have. Um I wouldn't be surprised, but he wouldn't be one of my first guys I sure, yeah. my first guy's Jomerson, but I think if I and then as a righty I would go after Demirs before Savard. But he would be somebody I wouldn't be surprised right. if they just happened to look at just because of the way things are um kind of going there. Um but I think um, now when it comes into this, a big thing we have to talk about this season, other than just trades, um, and we if we have more trade talk and get back to it in a little bit later in the podcast, is right about the 37-minute mark now as we covered Sam Moore and Brian Elliott, some expansion stuff and some trade talk. Uh, we'll get into the other goaltender who's not the birthday boy today. That is uh, Brian Elliott. Um, and Carter Hart, who's looked better since coming back from that um, – liaison week if that's what we want to call it i don't really know of a better word to describe to describe that uh week off the headspace week liaison week uh whatever we want to call that um it seemed to do him good justice and he looks better since being back in what have you thought of uh carter since coming back in and what have you thought of um some of the concerns that people have arisen over the, this year from Carter Hart's play of any of them warranted or any of them merited, or do you think, uh, what do you think about all that? I think Carter Hart's play looks better because the team has not played abysmal defensively in front of him. I think that's the only difference. I don't really understand what AV is talking about. Um, again, I'm not there, um, behind there. I, I don't know what AV was talking about when it comes to like training on stuff like that. I think most of the bad goals he's giving up are because the team around him is playing so poorly that he is inside of his own head because he's not having certain parts of around the net protected at all. Um, and I think he puts a lot of pressure on himself. So if that's part of the issue, sure. But as you can see, the team has played better. The results were better. It happens across the league everywhere. If you're a terrible team, no matter who's in net, he's getting lit up. And that's kind of what I see is like, yeah, if he played a little bit, or I'm sorry, um, Elliot played a little bit better than Hart this year, but when the team collapsed in front of uh, Elliot, he gave up six goals. Like, yeah. again, you can't do anything if your team doesn't play. I, let me just get this out real quick, Joe. The way that I've seen this team play D in that month of March, and I understand it's behind us and they have not played like that recently, was some of the worst defense I have ever seen ever watching this game. 
I just want to make that clear. And I do put that on the coaches. And I don't think it's acceptable. And I'm like, that's your system. And you guys were supposed to have them prepared. Why are they so ill-prepared all of a sudden? And why are you pointing fingers at everybody else? That's what I worry yeah. about. No, I do too, and I think a big thing is uh, Jason, I know, who you had on your podcast this week, uh, check out the Getting Gritty With It with Jason Martinez that your reef did, but um, he talked about what the heck's a goalie supposed to do if you just leave leave guys wide open. Um, There's not... There's not really much you can do there. Um, I also agree with your second point. Uh, the defense was abysmal in um, March, but it's definitely looked a lot better. So I think that goes into play, obviously, with how much better your goaltending looks. And I think that's what they hope, too. Um, having Carter come out for a week would kind of have the guys have that week to think about, wow, we really did suck in front of this kid this year. We probably should actually get our heads out of our ass and actually start playing better in front of this dude. Uh, I like that. So, well- can I, can I ask you something, Joe? And I, and I, want, I don't want to derail uh, your topic here, but I wanted to bring this up earlier. And it, it goes back to kind of the trade scenario and kind of this pointing at players and being like this one and this one, and we see Friedman get waved, and then we see like uh, Patrick on the fourth line, which is fine, actually. It's not a huge problem. And all this stuff. At a certain point, yeah, we've seen maybe. Fine in the past, uh, so that's not. It's, right, exactly. It's not, it's not, nothing is that crazy except for the fact that like, it, like AV is unhappy with this player and this player, and Chuck Fletcher is the one who's bringing these guys up. Like he's bringing up Lazinski. Chuck Fletcher barely uses him, or and I'm sorry, uh, AV barely uses him, and then sends him back down. Yeah. Right, and it's almost like is there a scenario here where the coaching staff and the GM might not agree? That like as what the players' values are. Like Fletcher's going, oh, like this guy's good, and he's going, I don't want this one. I think there might be a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah, there could be. I mean, who knows? I mean, there's also, um, when it comes to trade scenarios, too, if you were to move a Raffle or you were to move a Lawton, um, not this guy that I'm about to bring up is not the same exact player. He's sure. more offensive. But you have a forward that's about to just get cut by your rival right down the New Jersey turnpike in a, probably about the next 24 hours. Um, so... Or if he already got officially cut, then you can work today. perfect. So then you can already sign him, and then if you somehow make a playoff run, he can actually play if you sign him before Monday. Be cool. Um, if you sign, because the way that works, Nikita Goose says the guy we're talking about who got cut by New Jersey, if you sign him before 3 p.m., if you somehow do get to the postseason, then he would be eligible to play in the postseason if you sign him before the trade deadline expires. But he came over and did very well with 44 and 66 games, then just struggled immensely this season where he was in a new system with Lindy Ruff. Maybe he was a guy, most guys didn't in New Jersey, don't get me wrong, but maybe he was someone that did like the older system. It gelled with him better. Who knows? Maybe this whole season he's trying, he he's trying to adjust to a North American life while North America is in crisis. So that might play into it a little bit also. Potentially. Um, he, he's not, yeah, probably a big potentially, um, and he's not looking as good on the ice this year. So it seems like a change of scenery um, would be good for him. He only has five points in 20 games this year, but he's a high leverage um, guy that, that's a high. I would say he's more of a high leverage playmaker because he's not necessarily a high leverage shooter. He had 13 goals, a good amount of assists. Um, he's a guy that can kind of, when he's at his best, like he did in his first season, kind of be a play driver like you described um, Jakey as. He's a guy that in his first season – um, had, as I'm pulling it up here, uh, 31 assists to cap his 44 points with 13 goals. Um, so he's a guy that's going to be able to set people up. He's a guy, if you bring him in and he gels well with your locker room for the rest of the season, is also only 28. So if you bring him in, one, you're not giving up anything because he got cut. So if you sign him and bring him in, he does well. Then you sign him for more years, like another, say, two-year deal. So he's here until he's 30, 31, depending when his birth date is. That could be a good guy to bring in that you got for nothing. And then he actually gels well, and you brought in a nice sneaky pickup that you can actually use if you were to get rid of one of these forwards at the deadline. I don't see us picking up Goose if we don't get rid of anybody because sure. then you're just adding too much to the forward death. But if you get rid of somebody, I feel like he could be a good guy or getting Ricard Raquel, like I mentioned earlier, in a different sense. He's more of a tenacious player, could be a good guy. It's just for Raquel, you have to give up something 
to get Gusev, you have to give up absolutely nothing other than money to sign him because he's in the free agency. That might be a differentiating scale weight for the Flyers too. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that. maybe that's an interesting idea. Like if you do <clears throat> if you do move Scott Lawton, right? And you're like, well, I still I'm gonna move Lawton for first. I'm just throwing out a scenario. Move him for a first round pick because somebody wants him and they want to even run and re sign him or whatever. So they they trade for Lawton. He's gone. You got the first then you got Gusev here to kind of finish out the year and still kind of make a playoff push while also keeping the first round pick. So I like that idea. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the Ricard Raquel thing, I think if you're bringing him over, you're bringing him over for good. Gusev is more like, mm-hmm. it's more of an experiment. Well, wait you know what I mean? Yeah, let's see yeah, what you do. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Raquel, like, no, I agree I, with that. some team is going to give Raquel money, though. That's the thing is, like, we don't need Raquel, and that's we have to make moves to need Raquel. Where there's a team out there where they're going to be, maybe it's the Ducks, I don't know, but they're going to look at Raquel's skill set and be like, maybe it's the Devils, honestly, because they just got rid of Paul Mary. And, you know, they have a big young, you know, they have a young centers and they're like, they got rid of Zajac. Down, the, down their turnpike due to the fact mm-hmm. that uh, they might trade with how good he's been looking. I've seen while watching some Sportsnet clips, Dustin Brown could be on the market. So if he goes, I could see the Kings being one of the primary teams with the I, even bigger cap space they have left. I, well, hey, here's $5 million, record, Raquel. I like, would try to take <laughs> Drew Doughty. Like, if I was going to be aggressive this year, like, that's a guy I would try to go after, even though his cap hit is ridiculous. Like, but it's something, I think. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was, yeah. it's not more. Uh, oh, no, no, his is 11, actually, I think. It's 11, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no I'd idea. ask them to hold, yeah, I'd ask them to retain maybe a mil or two of that. Um, but that's a guy I would try to get. Like I would give them a. If I was going to trade Phil Myers, like I would trade Phil Myers for Drew Doughty, potentially. I'm not saying I definitely would, but you know, around that idea, it's like here's a young defenseman for your rebuild. We'll take a big chunk of that cash. This is kind of what I was talking about, and we'll take the culture change. And Drew Doughty will change this team overnight. And that's where I'm like, Dennis Savard is not going to change his team overnight. He's going to be another face in the crowd. No, Drew Doughty is going to change his team overnight. I feel right? like um, who do that in a. Yeah, Chara would do that. I feel like a guy, just because of his experience and what he's done, also where he's come from, Jomerson will do that, too, because he's kind of started. He's literally the definition of Drake's song. Um, Started from the bottom, now we're here. (laughs) Because he was not really – I don't think he was drafted, first of all. Um, Um, And then the Black – if if I'm not mistaken. um, And then the Hawks ended up uh, developing him into the defenseman that he became. Why do you think I'm so – annoyed that um the oh no he was drafted in the fourth round i'm sorry he was a mid-round pick yeah. but no this is the story with him he got drafted in 05 he just took so long to to hit it that's what it was with Jomerson. Mm-hmm. he got drafted in 05 he's a pre he, he just did he came up barely played in his first couple seasons struggled in his first few then in like 10 11 12 then he started really hitting it with them so he took a little bit to hit it. He's the perfect example of what you said earlier. Patience is a virtue with prospects. Um, he's now got re and uh, yeah, and done very well. Um, when they, this is the reason why I didn't want to lose Kolnick when we lost him. This is going back a while, but for Flyers fans that really pay attention to the team to know who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, uh, why is Kolnick now? Yeah, now on the Blackhawks looking pretty good in six games, and when I watch their games, their announcers talk about how much they like him. And the one comparison somebody threw out is the that the Hawks think they might be able to make this kid into a mini next edition of what they made Nick into, and I'm like, oh, sweet Jesus, why? Did no, we-? I don't even agree with that. Annette. <laughs> no, because he's a two-way defenseman, and Jalmerson's a defensive guy, so... Yeah, he I think is, they're overly but excited earlier in his him. career, Jalmerson did get you the assists. His, but his like offensive production, those twenty-two, yeah, those like those twenty-two, not, whatever assists. Yeah, he's not an offensive guy, yeah. but I feel like if you, you could turn it into, if you could turn him into that, yeah, Kolnick's more of a two-way guy. But if you could turn him into a top four, then the Flyers might look back at that going, eh, damn, we probably should have Chicago. I honestly oh. don't. I honestly don't think we're. Yeah, I know. I it sucks. But I honestly don't think the Flyers are going to go for a- after any of these guys. Not during the season. If it's a, if maybe during the off season, you know, with Jalmerson, I think I think they're going to roll with what they have. I think he's going to say, Yeah, I think be perfect to sign in the off season. Jalmerson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like after we get through this mess, 
he's a good addition, but we got to figure out what's wrong with this locker room. You know, like if we invest, if you do plan on keeping Jalmerson, you're not going to trade for him now, right? Because he's bronze, he's bronze age. It's the same type of thing. You can get him in the off season, right? You can sign him as a UFA. You don't need to trade an asset for him now if you're not really a playoff team. Having said that, you might be right, right? And maybe we don't have to trade much to get him. Like, if I only have to trade a third round or a fourth round pick to get Jalmerson because they don't have money, right? And he makes, I think, like four and a half mil and we have cap. And just for the year, yeah, I'm trading. I'm, I'm doing that, yeah. right? Like, that's well, the type of trade I would look for. But that would be the extent of what I think the Flyers are going to do. Realistic. That's a that's a good point. I would I would see I see them moving if they move anybody like the people I mentioned the lower forwards where then you can bring somebody back in. Sure. Which this year would probably just be Goose if he wants to sign because he's right there. Raquel might be more he's of going a to the Rangers. We know he's going to the Rangers. They're going to grab another Russian. They do, they do have those foreign connections. <laughs> exactly. with those, yeah, that Rangers team. But um, yeah, we'll have to see. But or the Capitals for that matter. Av. That's a good um, point. Yeah, but or not AV, OV. Oh, um, oh, the, yeah. OV, yeah. The goose I got you. But, I was with you though. Yeah. But um I think this is a good end topic to end on as we're at the 50 minute mark here. We thank you all for joining the video. Please subscribe if you enjoyed it, and we thank you all for the support. Uh you kind of leaned into it what we could do in the off season as we're trying to just look in at some too early off-season predictions of some guys we might go after. Since it's not even post-deadline yet, but we might as well just give some too early predictions and see how wrong we are uh, six months from now when we do another podcast and see if any of these guys are actually on our team. But if you look in the off-season, the Flyers, we saw our fan base on fan groups, different places, and writers writing about our center depth not being as good as we envisioned it being beyond the first two lines, obviously. Um, when it first started, because you're moving guys from wing back to center, back to center, back to wing, trying to maneuver the lineup to do everything. Somebody I have seen mentioned by some, the bring in on a one-year deal if he wants to, which this is a big key at a point of a player's career, too. Do they want to relocate across an entire country? But if he wants to do that, is – a guy like Getzlaff an option, and then if that's not an option, do you want to steal David Krejci if he will, if Boston doesn't want to pay him from Boston, who are both face-off wizards, play different types of game, but uh, both face-off wizards that are good centers and good leaders in the locker room? Would any of those two guys potentially interest you as a veteran centers to strengthen your core there in the offseason? I would say, actually, if I'm – if I'm getting Getzlaff, I'm less worried about adding a veteran defenseman. I love Ryan Getzlaff. Like, I would love that. As long as it's a short-term deal, the answer is absolutely. David Krejci I also very much like. I don't know if he's necessarily what we need because he's a smaller forward playmaking guy. He can help. He can definitely help. He's a talented dude. But we have guys who can do that where – Gets laugh. I feel like if I play him on my third line center or fourth line center, the way like Eric Stahl's used, not that I think he's that caliber. I think he's better than that. I think he's still a top six forward if you really need him. He's definitely a middle six guy. And I, I just think he's a game changer personality wise. That's kind of what I'm, if we can find a version of Gets laugh on D, that's exactly what this team needs. But if I can't get it on D, I'll take it on offense. Like I'll take Gets laugh for a year at seven million. Or six million. Like I'll give it to him because he'll change yeah. my locker room. You know? No, that makes sense. No, that makes sense. I agree with that. Getzlaff, I think, is definitely a guy. He's a guy that I was um thinking of uh as a free agent coming into this Love season. It. If uh there's awesome. somebody you might want to add. Uh if he didn't stink. Now I don't know. If maybe if he gets going a bit. A guy expiring, I was thinking of a bit with Stefan coming into the season, but he's doing pretty bad. So maybe if you want to bring him in on the cheap, uh, you could do that now. But he's not going to – I don't know how much he'll bring to you. A guy that is interesting as a forward, though, if you're going to let some forwards move and others come in, um, Brandon Saad, according to when I was looking at guys on Cap Friendly, supposed to be a free agent with cup-winning experience himself. Mm -hmm. Uh Yes, he gets banged up a bit at times, but does have 21 points, which I did not even realize he was doing that well this year. 21 points in 38 games. Um, so he's still producing when on the ice. To put that in perspective, Ryan Nugent-Hopkins is 28 and 40. So um, 
who's also a free agent. So you have a Brandon Saad who has cup winning experience. Um, if you bring him in, I think he's a good forward. If you were to say move a Lawton, or you were to say, especially because he's good on both ends too. If you were to move a Raffle, you're bringing in a younger guy that can kind of do that. Well, not younger than Lawton, but younger than Raffle that can do those same thing, which would make some sense to me if you were to move on from someone like that, try to sign a two or three year deal to maybe a Brandon Saad who plays good both ways and can score and assist some guys for you. I don't know if that's a guy that has any interest for you. I I definitely would be interested. It would require probably moving, at least moving out a guy like Lawton, because realistically, he, that guy's going to command at least three million, three and a half million per year on the market, yeah. right? Um, but he does bring an element we need, right? Big, strong, toughness, plays physical, plays in front of the net, also can score, also can pass. Does it, like He's a, a pretty good middle six option, right? We have not that with Lawton. Lawton is a different type of middle six player. But again, we're, we need that size. So I would be interested. Um, I'd be interested to see if Chicago would maybe re-sign him. I mean, they're pretty barren. That's the one thing I do. I, I think it's... It's exciting to talk about the UFAs, but some of these guys won't. Like Jalmerson probably will, but some of these it guys won't, won't make even it. make it. Like even Getzlaff might not even make it. Like he might just be like, "I want to stay here. I don't care." And they'll be like, "All right." That's you the know. big thing. That's why I brought it up at the beginning. Yeah. At this point of your career, if I'm 36 playing in Anaheim, Do I like move? I like this city. I'm not going to LA I grew, because I grew up here. But right. even then, if I'm 36 after I grew up in Philly in my career playing in Anaheim. I'm not so sure if I would want to come back to Philadelphia right, at that point, exactly. unless if I know for a fact we're going to win, because I have a beach right next to my house. Exactly. In, in, in well, so, so. And to that point, though, okay, but let's throw out this scenario here. Let's just say the Flyers do go out and they fix their D. Let's say they add a really good defenseman, and let's say they have to move some money and they still have cap space. Maybe that is how you convince a guy like Getz. I was like, yo, if you look at our team, I mean, we had a big issue with defense last year. We fixed that. And if we add you, I mean, just imagine, right? That's, That's how you why sell Boston, it. Boston, right? I think, is one of the. If he comes East Coast, I know. Don't even I say. I would it. say if Boston Sorry. gets rid of Krejci, they're one of the favorites to get get rid of. Yeah, but he's old. The I would be okay with that because Getzlaff's older, so it's like every any investment you're making a guy like that, it's really a one year, two year deal. Like I saw the Joe Pavelski oh, yeah. name thrown around. Oh, man, I would love – like, that's where I'm like, can I trade Voracek for Pavelski? And not that I necessarily want to do that, and we, we're getting the older player. But – or can I trade JVR for Pavelski, who I think that makes – do you see what I'm saying? Like, can we do that? That would work because the Caps only point something off. I think Joe's at exactly yeah. eight and JVR's at the seven point. I don't yeah. think they would do that, though, because I think JVR is an extra year, and I think that's where it screws us on that one. But I'm just throwing out an example. But like that's a guy who can change the locker room. Yeah, you'd have to eat yeah. a little bit after them to do yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. You'd have to add some big incentive to take away the the loss there because they don't want JVR more than Pavelski. But if we can get a guy like that, like a real a, a guy who will come, like even Yager, right? When he was old, like what did he do to he our changed. locker room? Yeah, we need a guy who can do that. And that's why I'm like, I don't know if Savard can do that. Like, if we can get Duncan Keith, I want Duncan Keith. That, you know, that, that like would 39 yeah. year old, whatever. I don't think he's 39. Yeah, yeah, so. that would that would change the room if he could. Yeah, 38 yeah. or something like that for Duncan. He's pretty but, old. Um, yeah, he he would change the room. Another guy um, that you might be able to bring in that would do the same. I know I mentioned it while on the pod with you yesterday. Was uh, Edler, who's not getting yeah. any younger, but seems like he never wants to leave. Um, but if he does leave, um, then maybe he would uh, come here for a year or so. And then Goligoski obviously also fits that territory. He's also 35. Um, that's been there, done that for years. That is a veteran that if he starts talking to you as a young defenseman, you're probably going to listen to him. Jomerson also fits into that category. Where Ryan Murray... Like, I, when I, I know went on some lives and doing some things, I like him. He's a nice defenseman. It's just he's still an ascending defenseman. So if Ryan Murray starts preaching to somebody, it's not that I don't want to respect Ryan Murray. It's just youngsters might not be as prone to listen to a Ryan Murray as they would be saying, oh, well, Nicholas Jomerson's telling me it's, to do blah, 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 blah. Exactly. He's won three cups. I should probably do. 
Yes. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you, man. Like, I, I totally, that's where I was like, I don't know if Dougie Hamilton will even solve what we need because he's got the skill set to do yeah. it. He's got the skill set, but I don't know if, he, like, like you said, Felino, that's a good example. I don't if know if you get Dougie Hamilton, that, that might be Myers getting traded for something because Myers is that guy that you always thought was right. when he first got picked up overseas, uh, not overseas, undrafted, I meant, uh, from over. Uh, he was a guy that, when he went to the Phantoms, was uh, would, would rush the zone yeah. too much. And then they had to hold back to play better defense. He's a guy, as he develops, you think is going to show more offense. He so will. if he develops to his full extent, he's kind of could be a mini Dougie, and then Dougie's the full all-star level right. offense touted Norris potential winning defenseman. Would you want two guys like that on the same team? I could find it. I could see how it could easily work if you have good work. lefty for match with them. But awesome. would they want that? So it will be interesting who's the guy you get rid of. Because if you bring in Dougie Hamilton, you're going to want him for a while. Who's the and guy that's not part of the future that you thought was part of the future? I mean, I would imagine if you think about it's really because you're not going to bring in Dougie Hamilton now. If you bring him in after expansion, right? And no, you yeah. have. Right, no, yeah, and that's what I assume you were saying. But then you have Provorov, Sanheim, Myers, and you have that top spot for Hamilton. At that point, you assume that Ghost is either there with the team, exposed, bought out, traded. I don't, I don't know if that's the case. Um, and then you leave that bottom pairing open to Braun and either Morin, right, or something like that, or Cam York. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's why I feel like you're going to have somebody else be an odd man out if you brought in a Hamilton, because with how Morin's playing, I think if he keeps playing this well, um, let alone the coaching staff, Fletcher, um, seeing how he's ascending, is going to want him to have a spot if he keeps ascending the way he's playing, where right. that's why I feel like bringing in Hamilton complicates things more. Since you also have other defensemen like Janing overseas, you have others um, on the team already in the Phantoms doing good. Uh, it's just going to overcomplicate Team St. Avani is another one. Over time, it, it, what are you doing years down the line? Where if you bring in Edler, you bring in Jomerson, you bring in those others, you're not clogging your defense core for like probably five to six years down the line. If you bring in Hamilton, you're probably going to sign him to at least a five to six right. year contract so it's it's a difference of what do you want here i feel like the flyers and i think you were kind of hitting at it last night and in other videos are more prone to get someone that changes the culture but they only have for a couple years rather than someone that changes the culture they're committed to for six years yeah yeah edler i mean i mean you named a bunch of good dudes because it's like they're gonna try to keep it short term like edler would be a guy he's probably not leaving but uh edler's a guy they would probably try savard like we were saying earlier like they'll try even more. How about Zadorov though? I've seen Zadorov as a guy mentioned in trade rumors. Now everyone sure. speaking of a guy, everyone counted down and out. Everybody, that's a guy. That's a guy that um that got picked in the first round. That everyone's like, ah, this guy's a bust. He's not. Well, he's a do big hit, <laughs> big hitter, yeah. right-handed, right? <laughs> yeah, blah 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 blah. Colorado got him going a little bit. Uh, he goes to Chicago, and they love him there, where I feel like he might not hit the free agency due to the second part of what I just said. Um, they love him in Chicago with how he's playing, so if he doesn't get traded, I feel like that's a sign that they want to keep him, and that's probably what they will do. So I feel like coming into the deadline is kind of going to tell you will he be on the market or not, because I feel like if they don't trade him, that's kind of them saying – we brought in a guy that we thought could kind of get going even more, and he has, so why the hell would we not keep him? You know who but. it could be? And this is a guy we didn't talk about this year. We talked a lot about him last year. Alec Martinez could be available in free agency as well. Yeah, that's a good He's 33 one. years old. He actually has a pretty good season. He's got 22 points, 7 goals, 15 assists. I mean, plus 16 on yeah, the year. I know the team's doing well. But, again, like I think that's what we'll try to do. I. I think, unfortunately, the way this team has played shocked everybody, and I don't think the smartest move would be to react to it because for all we know, and this might upset people when I say this, that this same team, without any changes, could be a Stanley Cup contender next year. That's how weird the results have been. So you can't freak out and assume you don't have yeah. anything you need. And right? I think also I always trust – like I still trust – Fletcher's coming in with uh, 
uh, as well, where I think he's kind of, like you said, learned from his past mistakes, where he's kind of learned from it. And then with Fares, our assistant GM, doing well, doing with the draft. I think they picked pretty well since coming in. He's used Hextall method still and hasn't changed up a lot there because he liked the system. You, If you can hit it, Gus, I think, was someone they identified going similar to how Chicago did with Zadorov. He started struggling a bit. Can we get him going back in the right, right. direction? That didn't work. So if but but that doesn't mean if you do that again it won't work because there there is like eighteen defensemen literally probably not that much but there's a crap ton in this free agency that are that that are literally guys that are not finishing this season or are on a downtrodden crap of a franchise <clears throat> Buffalo um, and um, might do better when they come elsewhere which is, for example, Brandon Montour and uh, Jake McCabe are two guys that are both 27 years old. Uh, I would look at if that's the case and are not just, well, Jake McCabe certainly ain't just offensive. And then Brandon Montour is a guy you have to work on his defensive side, but if he can get it going, look at what um, Pesce was, or not Pesce, excuse me, um, Brady Shea was able to do with Rob Rindemore, who was always offensive. Now he's one of the better graded defensive defensemen all of a sudden this year, and people are probably looking at stat sheets like, Like, right, wiping their eyes like those old cartoons going, wait a minute, is it the same guy I was looking at two seasons ago? Oh, well, hold on. Oh, well, uh, uh, okay. Um, But I think there's a lot of guys like that. Alexiak, even at 28, fits into that category. He's looked good. Can you get even a little bit more out of him? We've seen guys have some of their peak seasons at 29, 30 recently. Um, so can you get that out of Alexiak? Like, there's a lot of guys that have been there as late bloomers. Another one's Derek Forbert that now plays over 20 minutes for the Jets. I don't think anyone ever foresaw him having over 20 minutes of NHL value. He's a pure def a defensive guy that can pass a bit. There's there's guys that are big names, and there's guys you can mix in to add to your defensive depth in this offseason. I feel like the Flyers to change the room and change the vibe would be smart to do both. Get somebody that helps, that's always going to be in your lineup and get somebody that should probably always be in your lineup, but you're mixing in and out like a Forbert or somebody like that that's nice to bring in. I think if you do those things, it helps solve your room, too, when young guys seem to get in their own head. You have more than just one guy to talk to them at the right. defense. Yeah. So I think it's good to do that. And then you still might have Justin Braun, too, if you were not to, say, move on from him after coming off of a great season to try to, um, bring in different fresh blood. That would probably be the reason you would do that, just because right. he's coming off a good year and you might just want some fresh voices. That would be the reason I could see that. But um, I don't know if you had anything else when it came to um, off-season potential guys to go after. Um, honestly, uh, I did see Blake Coleman is available. Uh, if he makes it to market, I do think he's somebody we'd be very interested in, just like Saad. Um so maybe we'll go for a guy like that. I really, I honestly, at this point, my whole mindset is I need to see how they finish. It all depends on how they finish. Because in my opinion, like, we see the Islanders, okay? Mm -hmm. The Islanders are not the most talented team. They didn't make a ridiculous amount of moves to completely overhaul their team. And they got severely better results with a different coach. Having said that, it's the best coach in the league. But if my coach has lost the room, I need to know that first. Because if that is the case, then we might not have to do anywhere near the amount of changes that we think we do. And we actually have to change just leadership. Which means you don't have to go out and create all these changes in your locker room. Potentially. I'm, I'm not saying that that's the case. But that's how I would think of it is I would want to wait and see still. Um, but all the names that you mentioned, I mean, I would look at everybody. But Almost all of them require us moving a player out. And if I'm moving a player out at this point, like a value one, it's because I'm bringing in, in my mind, a star player. That's what I would I would either go boom or bust. Um, because a lot of like the little fixes, they'll help a little bit. But if we think we're just like a piece away, you know, then we I think we'll do that now. But I don't think we think that way because of the locker room disorder. So it's been really tough. I really want to see if can they organize that locker room? Like, I have a hard time believing that we lost all of this because of Niskanen. You know, it can't be because of one guy. Yeah, it can't just be because. Yeah, it can't just be because of one dude. I mean, you have um, 
nice uh, veterans in this free agency, like the Beninos, the Helms. Mm-hmm. If you were, there's a lot. Awful yeah. of the world. So I think there's a lot of the small guys, but there's a lot of the bigger guys um, you could go after too. Could you do what Buffalo did? And since he kind of was asked this year, um, convince uh, Taylor Hall to take a one-year contract to try to reprove himself again. Um, Possible. Maybe maybe that's on the table. So there's there's different Goes things. Goes back to Edmonton. Yeah, there's different things that would well, yeah, if he does that, he's definitely going to get paid. Um, because no matter if he goes back to Edmonton, he'll probably have a hundred point season. But the because you got he's going to be with either McDavid or Drysaddle, so no matter who he's with, he's going to get set up or set them up right. with them to get points. But no, I think there's a lot of options. I think uh, we definitely covered it good for some a uh, little early. Um, off-season projection. Zajac, if he doesn't go back to the Islanders, is another center you could add to your bottom core. Obviously, a great veteran. Uh, former, if I remember correctly, captain, I think, right? Wasn't he the Zajac, captain? yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so he's a guy that's obviously a good leader. So um, he's a he guy. He's almost could, 40, yeah. though. I think he might retire. He, he's see. going on 37. So, yeah, he could okay. retire. But we're up to I see. see I mean, if, if they don't win the cup, I don't think he'll retire because his quote recently was that's the mm-hmm. thing he's trying to do. So, I feel like he's one of those guys that's just going to keep hanging it on to the bitter end, unless if he finally actually, if, if the Islanders win Fair the enough. cup, then he might retire. Fair but enough. other than that, I feel like he probably wouldn't retire. They seem like a perfect candidate to lose in the Stanley Cup finals. Yeah, I heard you say that in last night's yeah. thing, too. But, um, <laughs> As I'll turn it over to you, if you have any closing points, first, I just want to thank everybody for joining us as we uh, gave a shout out to Moose for a happy birthday to Brian Moose Elliott. Uh, we talked some car park talk. Uh, we talked some trade deadlines, some potential trade talk, and some expansion draft talk, and then some who could we potentially grab two early predictions for the offseason talk. There's much other guys in there, like Nick Bukestad is a big ass dude. That's definitely, if you want to add to your physicality. Definitely as your physicality. He's a six, yep. seven fold. Um, he could be a guy that's decent to bring in till Ratcliffe's ready, the aforementioned Ratcliffe you brought up. So that's another guy that's in the free agency that I'll throw out there. I just always liked him as a player to watch just because he literally doesn't have to do anything to get to the front of the net other than move. Um, so it's always just fun watching him bully everybody. Um, so but he's a guy you could try to bring in. But do you have any closing points and um, anything you uh, want to bring up here and also any of the podcasts you do that you want to shout out also? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, definitely check out Flyers Nitty Gritty, the the website uh, that we follow. Obviously, Joe writes uh, for us as well. But, um, you know, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, I'm Y Wallach, Y-W-O-L-O-K, on every social media. So you can follow me on there. The podcast, I'm doing uh, Getting Gritty With It. I uh, started recording on Wednesdays now. Mondays were just too much of a pain for me. Um, so I just had the Jason Martinez episode out. Um, I do have Russ Cohen and Michael Jello from Hockey Buzz coming on next week. Um, and then I'm always doing I'm doing the Always Level Up podcast um, as well. That's kind of like off topic. Uh, that one I have episode five kind of got pushed back and rescheduled, but I have a couple I'm working on. It's a little harder to book those ones with, uh, more famous people or successful people, yeah. but, um, it's been interesting. So I, I do have more guests coming with that. So that's coming. Um, and I also Once have, uh, former flyers, um, uh, pro- well, not prospect, but former flyers, uh, organizational player, uh, Curtis Gabriel, who was here, Last yeah. year with the Lehigh Valley Phantoms, who's now fighting people and beating their behinds for this yeah. charge. It's awesome. Yeah, Curtis is great. Uh, yeah, I would highly recommend checking out those episodes. Really fun conversations there. Um, and from what I heard, they help people. So that's kind of the whole goal. Uh, and then there's uh, doing the Gritty Rant stuff. I'll keep doing that. Those are like the short bit stuff. Uh, yep. And then doing doing the live post games now. So they won't be every time, but um, I'll try to give people a heads up. It's kind of hard to do every game. But yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks again, Joe. This was really fun. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. I really appreciate you joining. Hopefully maybe in a couple more weeks as we get that understanding of what you said of where the team's at, then we'll come back on and kind of say where we think they're go now with that better understanding of if we think it's more staff 
or the guys or a mix of both or what it is at that point. So uh, stay tuned for that. Also, stay tuned for more hockey, baseball coverage, NFL, and a twinkling in of NBA we do on the Sports Fanatic News uh, channel. I appreciate you all for joining. Please like, comment, and subscribe. And as always, follow your Reefs channel. Obviously, Flyers Itty Gritty, Jamie's great channel. And as always, have a great and safe, pleasant day and enjoy all the great hockey action. It's crunch time, people. Even though the Flyers aren't in it, everybody always likes betting on the Stanley Cup playoffs. Maybe we'll get back in it. It's still crunch time, the best part of the time of the year to watch the hockey season. So enjoy the whole, all the great hockey action, and peace out, everybody.